So before we get started and speaking about current events, I thought I'd just go over a book that I finally completed as of this morning. Well, I kind of finished most of it, but I just had a little few pages left at the back. Towards the end, and it's the Gucci Mane, the autobiography of Gucci Mane, which I just finished uh, this morning. Um, interesting book. I'd say an easy read. I kind of ran through it in basically two weeks, but then I, know I kind of left the last bit because I thought I kind of summed up the entire story. But to kind of sum it up, this kind of charts Gucci Mane, I think just prior to him, it, in detail mostly, you get a big account of his kind of upbringing. You find out there, there is an actual big Gucci, right? Someone in his family that he was kind of named after, which is hence the name Gucci Mane. Um, there was an interesting past in terms of how he dealt with coming up in the drug game. There was also an interesting idea that even though he, I don't know, I, Gucci Mane kind of struck me from the beginning as always kind of being like, there's a... Um, there's a lot of those people in hip-hop now where they're sort of like the trap star become rapper, right? You're sort of like the popular guy in the hood, popular guy in the ends, and you kind of segue that fame into getting behind a microphone, getting in front of a camera and kind of making more of yourself that way, right? And you kind of use the street fame to kind of prop up your music and, you know, it can kind of build a cult following around you. But it seems as if Gucci Mane was reluctant to kind of, number one, glorify that street fame he had, and he was also very much about the music. He was a from the very beginning he went to have a prolific cat catalog right he went to have a discography that was long and i've always kind of been intrigued by his approach to making mixtapes or putting out albums he doesn't seem to really have any i wouldn't say care for quality control but there, t there tends to be a, uh he tends to have this approach where he would rather have more music out there to feed his fans than to Put, then to kind of hold off on releasing stuff in order for it to fit a project that he had not really re realized or hashed out yet so he'd rather just like whatever he records if it's ready and it's done and if he's been you know if he had a two-week period where he's just been locked in the studio and he's produced 24 songs he'd rather put those out as a collection of 24 songs for that period in time as opposed to like okay let me take four out there and put it over there and then take four over here and send it out and he'd rather just release them all out and there is an argument to be said that part of um, the reason why maybe Gucci Mane is maybe severely underrated, maybe in the same way like a Chief Keep is, is because they were unable to have that quality control. Like a lot of the best Chief Keep stuff I've probably seen online, you know, not to be unfair, has been some of the fan edits that have been kind of, they'll take mixtapes, they'll take kind of material from freestyles and they'll kind of put it together into their own hodgepodge mixtape and sort of have it uploaded for like, you know, for people to enjoy. And those have been some of the best things I've got from Gucci or even from Chief Keef. Some of their own projects have been a little bit lackluster, but I also appreciate the fact that he's just a machine. He consistently just puts out project after project after project. And I guess in some way, shape or form, even if he wasn't necessarily destined to be a hip hop great or a legend or to be successful, no, no, to be a legend, whatever it may be, he was going to be successful because of the amount of time and repetition that he put into his work. Like, I don't, it's, I'm not sure, maybe um, American Idol and X Factor guests are a weird sort of like um, anomaly in this, but, I don't think it's possible to do something that often to that level that yeah on that sort of level consistency and not get good at it you have to get good or you have to be at least passable and then I think a lot of it has to do with staying power that's a lot you hear about the story from Gucci Mane his autobiography is that he withstood so many trials and tribulations right so many things came at him in life but some most of it of course was his own sort of like self-sabotage every time he seemed to like get a bit of a headway in his life he would do some sort of brain dead numb skull thing like fight a random in a supermarket in a shopping mall somewhere in middle america um just as he was getting his life in order he'd kind of succumb himself to drugs and alcohol loads of things happened during that process but he just ended up he just got this stickability about him he just doesn't he doesn't um go away like even when he's gone away when he comes back out he's, you know, he's got you know uh, straight. Uh, what do you call it? First day out. Fuck the feds. You know what I mean? He's got that kind of work ethic where it consistently just uh, he's always showing up. And I guess again, that's a lesson that could be applied to anyone in life, right? Um, the idea of just hanging around long enough and waiting for your opportunity to come, or waiting for other people to leave, and then for you just to be the only default choice, is a good option. I don't think it's a bad option. I think the idea that you're going to be divinely chosen and picked up from a crowd of like, oh, we want you. That one over there is special. Isn't necessarily how things go happen, isn't it? Most things happen, it's because of luck, right? It's because of being in the right place at the right time. But to take advantage of that right place, right time, you have to be in the right mindset. You have to be doing the work. You have to be approaching it with a, with a kind of studious work, work, work ethic and all that sort of good stuff. So that was very interesting. And I also like the idea that 
for the very beginning he was all he always had the idea of being a barry gordy character right the kind of puppet master behind the artist or the artiste um in his clique the guy that was kind of pushing the scene forward um without everyone knowing that it was him so the kind of rapping thing came after more so he wanted to be the hood the guy on the streets who kind of put in money behind the established artist to kind of diversify his portfolio so to speak and that's obviously carried on with the stuff that he's done nowadays right with the people that he signed now i think he signed recently some new kid um to 1017 whatever his new imprint he's got but he kind of specifies in the book that he never wanted i think which is something that again which i think you make decisions in your life and you decide to kind of just stick with it it's quite hard to do but he did say in the book that um when he decided to put a record label or put us roster together he very he didn't want to repeat the same mistakes that he did when he was on the street so i think on the streets he was known to be a bit shady i think waka flocker kind of spoke upon it a little bit when they were going through their back and forth he kind of did make some overtures that you know gucci isn't the guy that everyone thinks he is he's a you know he's got a lot of enemies in the streets which is why he kind of intimated that that's why gucci was kind of holed up in his house somewhere in the middle of la and not kind of going back to the hood and why haven't you seen gucci back in the hood because obviously what people have still got money on his head blah, blah 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 and he kind of speaks about that a little bit you know in you know without saying too much saying basically that he didn't want to repeat the same mistakes he didn't want to be that same guy in the hood that he was that he's going to be in the music industry he wanted to kind of put a platform there in the music industry to kind of prop up the young guy and he said it was a cheat code for him to kind of always stay plugged in because he was always he was always aware that he was never going to be the most hippest on point guy but he just wanted to have a he wanted to have he wanted to use he wanted to have those artists on his label and use them as a temperature gauge just to kind of gauge what's going on and i guess that's what he's been able to do really well because i think that's the one thing um dame dash mentioned quite often in his interviews right that whenever people are like oh why aren't you back in the hip-hop game why aren't you back in the club doing signing artists and he'd always say something along the lines of like he always was afraid of being the 40 year old guy in a nightclub you know trying to get down with the kids no one wants to do that right so the only way to do that so the only way to circumvent that is to kind of sign people around you who are younger who can do the work for you and then you can oversee it from like a mogul point of view and see the longer uh bigger play at work and make decisions based on that way but to, to but to kind of you know for him to kind of be at one of hanging out with the children or to be at you know h hollywood whatever next establishment isn't necessarily the best way to kind of use his expertise you kind of want gucci to be a bit further down the line right you kind of want your sort of like um scene kind of influencers to do all the legwork and then for them to kind of vet the person and then when they're ready bring them to you and that's good you can then kind of you know um polish them up and adjust and do all the fine tuning to then present them to the world but if Gucci's the one at the nightclub, it just doesn't what make, make sense. I think that's, again, part of the reason why he's been such a legend and been so on that a lot of kids have kind of looked up to him for, you know what, you can model his career around it. Because I think similar to like, who I would say, maybe not, it's not, I don't know, there's quite a few of them. I think maybe people wouldn't, just wouldn't subscribe, but I think even similar to like something like 2 Chains, I would, you wouldn't say 2 Chains was like a, a naturally gifted rapper, but for just hard work and perseverance, they've turned into absolute animals. And I think that's what, I kind of get from the story of Gucci Mane like maybe he wasn't you know he wasn't born to be Nasir right he wasn't born to be Rick Ross or Jay-Z but what he had was work ethic to outwork everyone else that was had the aspirations to be those dudes so maybe he wasn't as talented but the hard work the hustle just kind of boosted him to that level so I really recommend you check out the book again it's a really short read you could probably get through it if there's an audiobook available which I think there is but I don't think it's read by him I don't think so but definitely check it out Geographer, Autobiography by Gucci Mane by Neil Martinez uh, Belkin. It's a superb book, really great. Loads of amazing pictures as well that I'll show for the camera people just to see what it's about. But yeah, loads of interesting pictures of Gucci from back in the day with his belly. So right here. Yeah, with his huge belly from back in the day. Do you remember all those pictures? Yeah, it was a good era. And you think he mentions in the book as well the reason why his belly was so big is because of the lean. It supposedly makes your belly go potty and stuff so he wasn't so which is true because when you look at his chest he didn't look that fat it's just you know the bloatedness that came from alcohol for the most part and he got sober in jail he speaks really well about his wife keisha on here too and just as a, it's a but again i think it's a good book because they, every time you think he just about gets his life sorted and he's got everything worked out he fucks up again like it just continually goes on until the very end when he finally gets it together and makes a change but i think 
the fact that the record industry gave him so many chances just speaks to the character that he has the character of the man i think for the most part i think most people could tell that he's a good dude because i think that's something i've learned quite um i've learned as well especially from listening to a lot of comedy uh, comedy based podcasts that are talking about hollywood and the industry and one thing you always hear a lot is that you know anytime you're sat there wondering where a certain actor is right a certain performer a certain entertainer if you're wondering where they are you haven't seen them in a while it's usually because number one they probably got lost in the source and they're not working right they're not going to audition and stuff and secondly it's down to the fact that you know they're not well liked in the industry people just think they're a pain in the ass to deal with so the industry usually just shuts their doors on you because much like sports um there's always a conveyor belt of people waiting to take your place right ready and willing to work hard to hustle to bust their ass and shit so if you're the kind of diva on set and you're only 21 and you've got no many, you don't have many credits to your name apart from, I don't know, one really famous film you do when you're 17. You can't rest on your laurels. You have to assume that if you piss somebody off, they're just going to get you out of the way and get the next person in who's not a headache to deal with. So I think even though Gucci got involved, with, got arrested by the police and all this sort of stuff, I think deep down a lot of people in the industry kind of liked him and they thought he had a big part to play. And obviously he's super plugged in with the Atlanta scene. They always wanted to give him a chance because the talent was obviously there and the work ethic was too. He just got lost in the source, as he famously says in his own interview. So, um, again, I think it's a great cautionary tale. It's a, again, it's not too fluffy, and it tells the story of somebody who I kind of consider to be a mainstay in the industry and somebody who's kind of flown the flag for collaborating with those different people, putting out experimental projects, um, really changing the game in terms of the amount of projects he put out. His discography must be, I don't know, it must be in the high hundreds, isn't it? Or no higher, well, high double digits probably you know let's see how many actual tapes Gucci Mane actually has out I want to see this myself let's check this up on the screen put this up on here ba, 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 ba. let's see discography of Gucci Mane and he probably has prob and I think I like the thing he says in the autobiography about something like um when he decides to make a change he just decides to do it like he decided that this was going to be his life he's just going to leave a sober existence and just get back to working hard and he's just stuck with it it hasn't been that difficult and i guess you I, I quite like hearing that message you hear some too often people are like oh it was so difficult i had to do this, I had to do this. you know what i mean like i like the idea that he was like no i made it this like i fucked up so so many times in my life the only other option was to just get right and you know he got right and look where he's at now so let's see his um studio albums how many is that so far one two so, so trap house hard to kill trap of fun back to the trap house murder was the case the state of Roderick davis the appeal the return of mr zone six everybody looking the return of east atlanta santa mr davis el gato the human glacier i love that title so much evil genius Delusions of Grandeur, Rutoba, East Atlanta, Santa. But you can definitely tell the difference in direction from that 2016 onwards, especially with the names of the albums. But that's already what? That's like 11 or 12 projects, isn't it? Right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 projects. That is insane. 16. And that's not even including all the kind of the mix text you put out over the years. The mix text is just, look at this. The mix text is just insane. It just keeps going. And um, maybe there's a clever play there because you know with um, Megan Thee Stallion's label situation and her deal, maybe there was a clever play in terms of instead of listing your stuff as mixtapes, you put them out of studio albums so that you can kind of quicken the process of you getting out of your deal and then renegotiating it. Because if you, but then I guess most artists don't want to do that because they're afraid of one of their they're afraid that album number five out of six that's come out in four years performs really badly sales wise so that it's going to decrease their chance of negotiating properly but i don't know if i would be negotiating with a record label i'd renegotiate based on my entire catalog not what my what not what i did last right because even if you get a deal from a record label usually you're signing a deal with x amount of numbers x amount of albums in place anyway right yes i know a lot of the record labels are looking at what you, how you perform first week and that sort of stuff and it's it really is a, probably a bit of a what did you do for me lately industry but i don't know if i did five albums and i completed it i'd want you to look at the entire catalog of the five like what i've done along with it marketing events promotion activations interviews all that stuff will kind of play into your renegotiating i'd imagine so right podcast appearances um traction on social media in terms of if you've been imagine you went to like a fashion show and you happen to have the picture that went the most viral 
that would also play into the fact that how you negotiate so I don't know why a lot more artists don't do what he did now I guess the only close example I'd say is maybe like a Russ right he did the prolonged period of like dropping a tune is it a tune a week right for ages he just won with a new song and that kind of built a lot of traction up and um that kind of gave people a chance to kind of again i guess if you're a fan of russ you'd probably be able to see a change from like track one one week one to week 15 to week 13 to week 27 right there was definitely a progression there you'd hope so and i'm assuming he probably got better understanding what his audience wants what his sound is about and then once you go to negotiate they wouldn't just take the last track you upload number 96 they look at the entire catalog and be like oh whoa we definitely saw you got like 22 players on number one and now all of a sudden number 85 is like 55 no, 500,000 or some shit that'd be a good little way to kind of show that organically you're able to grow your audience so just imagine if you're able to plug into like a major label what that could do for your career so that would probably be a good way to look at it but I don't know maybe there's more intrinsic details I'm not aware of in the record label industry but I think that's a good way to kind of look and maneuver the situation but again like I said um, definitely check out the book it's available now on Amazon all, that, all those other good places and probably available on audiobook too but yeah it's a really short read easy to get through and um yeah i enjoyed kind of finding out a bit more about someone that i kind of looked up to for a long time but i still look up to actually in terms of how he approaches the industry and that stuff so yeah check that out